Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Paz Canales. I'm the head of legal uh, policy and research at Global Partner Digitals, a, a civil society organization that work in the issues related with technology governance. I am very pleased to be here and have the pleasure of being the moderator of this main session on artificial intelligence for IGF 2023 that we have called the AI that we want. So I have the honor to have a distinguished uh, panel of uh, speakers here for uh, enlightening this conversation. I, I will start to introduce them and then I will uh, bring some logistics for the unfolding of the session and we will enter in the substantive discussion. So we have today Ms. Arisa Emma. Uh, she is an associated professor at the University of Tokyo and visiting researcher at the Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence Project in Japan. We have with us Dr. Clara Nepal. Dr. Nepal is the senior director of the IEEE Europe headquartered in Vienna and head of the IEEE Technology Center for Climate. We have today Ms. Uh, James, Mr. James Harrison, currently uh, the um, head of international policy and partnership at OpenAI. Thank you very much. We have Dr. Seth Center, who is the deputy em envoy for critical and emerging technology and previous government service include uh, as a member of the State Department policy, the planning staff, where he helped develop the Department Cyberspace and Emerging Technology Strategic Framework, and as a senior advisor to the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, where he led the writing of the commission uh, final report. Finally, but very importantly, from civil society representation, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Tobikele Matimbe, who is a human rights lawyer, researcher, and social justice activist from Zimbabwe, serving at Paradigm Initiative as senior manager of partnerships and engagement. So the way in which this session will be organized is like we will uh, pose some um, policy questions that have uh, been at the center of the designing of the session to the distinguished uh, speakers, and we will have um, two rounds of questions uh, for the first section. Each uh, panelist will intervene for five minutes, and then we will be followed by 10 minutes of questions and comments, reaction from uh, the floor here inside. So for that, I ask you to uh, put in line in front of the microphone uh, if you will want to present some questions to the speakers, and also for our remote participant, please let us, our remote um, moderator, sorry, <laughs> Christian Ginley, which is also part of the, of the panel, um, to know if you have any questions that would like he uh, provide to the speakers during the session. So with that uh, being said, I will move to um, setting a little bit the scene of this conversation today. In that sense, I would like to highlight a couple of, um, of things that, for me, are really relevant in, in the, the conversation today. The first thing that I want to um, uh, kind of uh, be provocative with you in terms of, 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 the, of the setting of the scene of the, of the session is like to think about how, uh, during the last year, we have been uh, listening uh, so much about artificial intelligence in our daily life. So people that it was not connected at all with the thematic of the artificial intelligence, maybe not even familiar with the, with the, with the name of the technology, now was interesting to know more about uh, how this technology functions and how we will uh, take care of ensuring that the technology will be at the service of the benefit of the, of the exercise of right and, and, and the daily life of anyone around the world. So this is the challenge that has been posted by the, by the current reality and by the demands that come from the, from the people and the pressure that is being put in governments and, and companies to get uh, to uh, find uh, the way in which uh, artificial intelligence will be governed for ensuring particularly that it's developed, deployed, and, 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 and used in a way that is beneficial for, for the human good. What uh, we have been uh, seeing is like for 
maximize this artificial intelligence positive aspect in society, there is a fundamental need of agreeing in responsible and ethical uh, principle for the development. Uh, and what I bring today as a proposition is that part of that discussion also should be mindful and be grounded in, in what is coming from the international framework of human rights as an, an essential element for guiding this task of uh, thinking about technical standards, regulation, legislation at large, and other kind of voluntary guidance that can be developed for governance of artificial intelligence. So in that sense, uh, I have been working with my organization in, in proposing a number of principles that are linked with how we can make the international uh, human rights framework applicable to the conversation of artificial intelligence. And uh, we have come with five principles. The first one, like to think that any kind of governance discussion about artificial intelligence should be grounded in approaches that have been developed uh, in terms of the promotion and protection of human rights law, as we have been discussed for all the rounds of new and emerging technologies that have preceded artificial intelligence. The second one is that develop a, a risk a basic approach to the design, development, and, and deployment of artificial intelligence. And I am pretty sure that part of the conversation with the panelists today will be a, um, unpacking what we mean by risk and what we mean for those assessments. The first one, the third one, it's promote an open and inclusive design, deployment, uh, and, and use of the artificial intelligence uh, technology. And then we uh, also uh, invite you to think about how we need to ensure transparency in the design, development, and deployment of AI, and hold the designers and deployers art of artificial intelligence accountable for risk and harms. So without more from me with this proposition, we want to hear from every one of the panelists and we will start the first round of comments um, and, and to, to, to talk about particularly um, the, the two policy questions that have been proposed by the organizers of the session uh, in, in uh, the MAG that invite us to think about in the first round of our conversation on the matter of how the global processes connect uh, that have been discussing around governance of international, um, sorry, the governance of artificial intelligence at the international level, but also at the local level with a side of uh, regulating or uh, guiding the governance for greater good. My first invitation to intervene will be for uh, Ms. Arisa Emma, and I want to ask you how we move from the ethical principles and technical guidance to operational artificial intelligence governance that it's effective uh, in policy across jurisdictions. Thank you, Maria, for a very nice and kind introduction, and I'm really honored to be at uh, this panel. Uh, and uh, for the question uh, you raised, it's very important, especially when we consider how actually the technology develops, uh, uh, not only like the design, but also like the uh, developed, the deployed, and used uh, across the borders. And uh, uh, for example, here in Japan, uh, it's it's uh, the, the the normal cases is that uh, maybe uh, we use this the core AI model, uh, for example, from the United States, and then it's the deployers is in the Japanese startup company, but also the actual vendor is the the under the different company, and the users actually don't know who actually create this AI model and uh, where who, who is actually in this long supply chain. So uh, in, in that sense, um, it is really important important to have uh, uh, the, the transparency uh, about uh, when we actually uh, see the, this AI life cycle. And uh, not only the transparency, but also it needs to be uh, interoperable. Uh, and uh, this, this word, the, the framework interoperability, is actually mentioned in the G7 communique uh, in the 2020 at uh, the Takamatsu. But uh, somehow this, this is kind of like a very tricky word. What does it mean by the you know, framework interoperability? So what's the, the, the difference between like, the technical standards? Uh, so the thing I am, what I interpret uh, by that word is that uh, we, we need to uh, know uh, 
uh, uh, that each country or the each uh, organization or the maybe each even one of the one company has its own policy and their own way of the assessing their AI systems and uh, also uh, evaluating the risk and making the impact assessments. Uh, however, uh, the the legal system is uh, different from country to country, and uh, so uh, each country's discipline uh, should be. Uh, Respected, and, uh, and other, otherwise, it, it, the, you know, this global uh, discussion won't work. Uh, and also, each country has its own context. For example, in Japan, uh, we actually have uh, the guidelines towards this AI, uh, the utilization or the AI development, and not so much on the uh, the, non, the the binding one. So we actually go to the non-binding guidelines, and also. Uh, most of the Japanese company actually uh, very uh, uh, look into uh, the public reputation and uh, th that kind of uh, uh, the soft law uh, discipline actually really works. And but, but that might be the Japanese case, and uh, uh, the other country or the other organization might have different. Uh, Aspect, so uh, it's it's really important to know the uh, what uh, actually uh, what kind companies or the what country has its own uh, risk management framework or the risk assessment frameworks, and with that transparency and also that the uh, exchanging the actual cases is really important. And uh, uh, as uh, I really appreciate that Maria uh, raised the discussion on the risk-based assessment. So what does it mean by risk? So uh, there, uh, we can discuss at the high-level risk or the low-level risk. But uh, for example, when taking consideration about like the facial recognition system used in the airport or maybe used in the entrance of the building, the usage is totally different, but maybe uh, using the same facial recognition system. So the, we, we need to look into the context and uh, we need to take into the who, who is actually using, who is benefiting from it, and who has the risk on it. So exchanging the cases is really important. And in that way, uh, I think uh, we can uh, put all these kind of abstract principles into more, more kind of living uh, uh, kind of a discussion as the making it to practices. So maybe I will stop here. Thank you very much, Arisa. And I will want to continue that line of conversation, inviting Clara to also jump in in her take in how technical standards relate to ethical principles and can support effective, responsible AI governance at the global level, and how it's your experience about how technical standards can account for these challenges, these ethical challenge, and the principles that are uh, posted but also human rights international standards according to my provocation at the beginning. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for having me here. Um, so um, IEEE is a very old organization. We were founded more uh, by 140, 140 years ago, uh, co-founded by Edison. So why would an inventor like Edison, uh, with, who invented electricity, engage with others? Um, he could have done it alone. Uh, and I think it was this realization that in order to be accepted by society, you have to manage risks. And one risk at that time was clearly safety. And we started actually by um, dealing with safety. And since then, we are dealing with safety and security. But now with AI, we see that we actually need to redefine risk. We have to move away from this, let's say, more traditional dimensions of risks like safety and security and incorporate human rights that you just mentioned. And the question is how to do that. Um, we started very early on, and it, it's a bottom-up approach. So we, have, we are also the largest technical organization in the world with more than 400,000 members worldwide. And these issues started to come up at the individual level very early on. These issues um, around uh, what you just mentioned, about bias and so on. The question was how to deal with them. So we started an initiative called Ethical Aligned Design, which identified the issues, tried to um, manage them uh, with standards, for instance, but also with engaging with regulators. Uh, now, when it comes to standards, we moved to so-called socio-technical standards. What are they? So these are from value-based design to common terminology. Value-based design, what does it mean? 
It means taking values of the stakeholders in that context that you just mentioned into account, and that will be different values. Of course, human rights are always important, but you have different ways of how you are dealing with them. And how you prioritize these uh, values and actually translate them into system requirements and giving the step-by-step -step methodology for uh, developers uh, proved to be a very efficient uh, standard. Common terminology. What do we mean if we say transparency? It can mean it's a completely different thing to a developer than for a user. So that's also one of the standards that deals with defining different levels of transparency. Bias, the same thing. We all want to have um, uh, eliminating bias from systems, but we actually need bias, for instance, in healthcare. We need to take into account the differences uh, in symptoms for men and women uh, because they react differently, for instance, when they have a heart attack. So context is very important. Uh, so we also complemented these standards with a certification, an ethical certification system. And we tried it out with uh, public and private actors. Uh, and what is very important, uh, after all, I think that it was mentioned before, is to start building up uh, capacity in terms of training. Because we need this, um, this combination between technical expertise and expertise in social legal matters uh, and so on. So we, uh, as part of the certification process, we have a competency framework uh, which defines what are the uh, skills necessary for a trainer, for assessors, for certifiers. And we started working also for certification bodies. So to build up this ecosystem which needs to uh, be there in order to, uh, to make this happen. So this bottom-up approach, of course, needs to be complemented by the top-down approach, the regulatory, uh, uh, regulatory frameworks. And we engaged with the Council of Europe from the European Union and uh, OECD and so on from very early on, from the principles, but also how to operationalize uh, then this regulation. Um, one example is now with the AI Act, with, which basically mandates certain standards, where we also engage with the European Commission to see how we can map, let's say, the regulatory requirements to standards. There is a report from the Joint Research Center that you can download. Thank you, I think. Thank you very much, <laughs> Clara. Um, we're going to move now to hear a little bit uh, on the take from James that represents some perspective on the private sector experience, and particularly following the flow of this conversation, Clara mentioned the values, the, the definitions of the values, but also the de definitions of the terms of the frameworks that we will be using. So in that sense, my provocation and question to you is like, aside from the government efforts, the multilateral efforts, the technical standard efforts that we have been hearing, what are the, the, the current uh, efforts that the private sector are, over, uh, are, are conducting for reflecting some of these challenges of like finding uh, ways to address responsible AI govern governance and, and how those link with the conversation that we are having here around ethical principles but also human rights protection. Uh, so let us know what is your take on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I think one of the places we really began is, you know, to listen um, and sort of to understand uh, as the tools that we build uh, are used in novel ways and as we explore sort of the new capabilities, um, learning from expert communities and academics and standards bodies, uh, governments around the world who are evaluating and testing. Um, what are the new harms that we haven't anticipated? I mean, we know that we uh, won't uh, know them all uh, ahead of time, and we try to take a really iterative approach and really explain um, what we're building and how we're building through tools like our system cards and inviting sort of open red teaming and evaluation of our, of our tools. Um, but, but really understanding, you know, what is it that we don't know? Where are the places in which languages are our tools not performing well? Um, where are the places where definitions, as have been discussed, uh, need sort of stronger concrete backing so that, you know, we, we know that as we're building these international conversations that we're speaking the same language and sort of able to cut through whether it's marketing by the private sector or areas that uh, have yet to be sort of fully defined. 
um, that we're building from a common understanding. Uh, I think another important role for the private sector and that we really take seriously at, at OpenAI is just capacity building. Um, you know, in, in sort of building the capacity for research teams of all types across civil society and human rights organizations and governments uh, to, to be involved in this testing, to tell us what's working, what's not, um, capabilities that they'd like to see or ones that are, are, are not, uh, not working. Um, and so, you know, this is something that's, that's going to be iterative. You know, we are, are clear as when we do our disclosures, uh, you know, at the release of new tools about all the areas that we're trying to solve for. You know, there are important research questions about the future of, uh, of things like, you know, hallucinations and understanding, uh, you know, where uh, watermarking, uh, how, how, to, how to solve for watermarking questions across text or different types of uh, uh, video or, uh, or different types of outputs across uh, uh, LLM tools. So, you know, our contributions, I think, begin with, you know, admitting what we don't know, admitting the places where there's a lot of work to do, trying to help with the capacity building to, to, to work on safety and evaluation of these systems and really supporting work around the world by the public sector, by the private sector, by civil society, by academia, uh, to get the future of these, tooling, this, these tools right and ensure that the conversations that we're having around the world really level into concrete action that, that ensures the, the long-term safety of, of artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. I'm going to turn now to uh, Dr. Center that represents uh, the U.S. government in, in this uh, conversation. And I will be curious, like particularly with the frame that I presented at the beginning of the conversation of the pressures that are coming from the broader public now to governments to turn to action in relationship with harnessing the, the power of artificial intelligence for good. What is right now the, the perspective and the take um, of the U.S. government about the, the more pressing challenges in the global governance of AI and how those also relate with the actions and the collaborative work that you in the domestic level are taking also with the private sector, with other governments to effectively address those challenges that you identify as the most pressing ones. Thank you. Great, and thanks so much. I think pr pressure is an interesting word to, to <laughs> characterize the situation that we're all in, not just governments. Uh, I think part of the reason why all of us are here and excited about AI uh, and somewhat scared as well is because there's a sense that we're in a transformative era. And given that the IEEE was founded by Thomas Edison, I'll start with a Thomas Edison quote. I wasn't planning on it because it's my favorite Thomas Edison quote. He was asked uh, at the turn of the 19th century, uh, about 20 years after the light bulb uh, was developed, what the effect of electricity was gonna be on the world. And he said, electricity holds the secrets that are gonna reorganize the entire life of the world. You could apply that to artificial intelligence. The problem with that analogy is, at least in the United States, it took several decades to get to a regulatory framework for electricity. And I think no one here thinks we can wait several decades to get to a governance framework that includes regulation for AI because of the pressure. So with that being said, um, first of all, I commend an organization like IGF for bringing together a diverse group of multi-stakeholders like this to have a conversation about how to accelerate the pace of governance. I thank Japan in particular for hosting us and leading the G7 Hiroshima process. And we saw the effort and the pressure and the way in which speed can create results through that process. And then from that basis, let me just make four points, and I have about 30 seconds to make each of the points. Point one is perspective um, for all of us on AI governance. I think we have a solid foundation based in a multi-stakeholder approach to developing the principles for AI, uh, the OECD principles from 2019, the G20 principles as well. Within the United States, uh, in the past couple years, we've developed two frameworks that are extremely important, and they touch on the human rights and values component of this as well, both of which were developed with extensive consultation across the multi-stakeholder community. One is the AI Bill of Rights, and the other is the National Institutes of um, Standards and Technologies Risk Management Framework. That had over 240 consultations over 18 months with the multi-stakeholder community to develop a, a framework for how to apply 
um, uh, a safety and security framework to developing AI. So that's the kind of perspective that we have to take to the challenges we have. Why then, if we have such a rock solid foundation, are we having this conversation today? The obvious answer is GPT has created a new socio-cultural political phenomenon, a new moment. In part, it is the Sputnik that all of us were waiting for when we were talking about AI to grip all of us into action uh, several years ago. Um, but in part, it's because it's raised all kinds of profound questions uh, about safety, security, risk. And so we have to take it on in a new and s substantial way. And that moves us into um, two problems or challenges. One is it intensifies and accelerates uh, all of our fears that emerge from the digital era. And the other is it intensifies and accelerates all of our hopes and opportunities that come from a technological revolution. And so we need to get that balance right. I think all of us accept that, and that requires moving quickly. For the United States, speed then meant we have to balance between moving towards a regulatory framework eventually with getting governance action now. Our choice in the interim uh, was to move towards what were called voluntary commitments that touch on a framework of safety, security, and trust, which hold companies accountable uh, for a whole series of efforts to become more transparent, to protect security, to promote transparency, to ensure that their systems work as intended. Uh, and that's basically our, our, our overarching architecture for what we're approaching this era of when we're, we need clarity, we need speed, uh, and we have to act in this era of pressure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Santer. And I will move in this flow of the conversation with uh, Toby Kille. Uh, and particularly with a reaction from your side in terms of where is the Global South perspective in all this conversation. Uh, we, we heard of like uh, alternative path of uh, dealing with uh, artificial intelligence governance uh, that usually are commonly led by Global North governments or Global North uh, organization from the private sector, from the academia, for, from the industry. So what are the fundamental challenges and opportunities to build effective artificial intelligence governance that work for your own institutional uh, context and sociopolitical context coming from uh, a country from the global south? And how do you experience the influence of these different trends coming from, from abroad, from, from this, this, this different sector, the regulatory ones, but also the ones that are related with different frameworks to address these issues of governance? Thank you. Thank you so much, um, and it's a pleasure to be here and part of this panel as well. I will just highlight that um, from um, a perspective of um, you know, the Global South, or rather I'll just maybe narrow it down to the African continent. I think where we are in terms of regulatory frameworks, we are at a place where um, we're still trying to catch up with regards to coming up with national artificial intelligence strategies, and what we have are data protection laws that have sort of like, you know, just a drop in the ocean when looking at um, clauses that address automated decision making or algorithmic um, you know, decisions. Um, and at looking at that kind of um, context, we um, are facing a situation where um, we, we're trying to catch up with regards to how we can um, ensure the protection of human rights when we're looking at um, artificial intelligence, the design processes, as well as the use. Um, because of that, you'd find that um, it's important that um, that context is, is well understood and well centered because when we're looking at artificial intelligence design and usage, we have to appreciate that there, is, there are definitely centers of power. Um, what I mean by centers of power, when we looking at um, you know who has the knowledge of of technology who has um, you know the technical um, you know um, design um, sort of like um, you know ownership you'd, you'd see that uh, within the global south we are lagging behind and because of that there is a need for um, inclusivity uh, of voices from the global south um, in whichever processes that are there even at um, at a global stage or a global scene there's need for uh, inclusivity um, of, of um, not just uh, civil society but as well um, inclusivity when we're looking at uh, representation and member states as well and their participation, and I think the Internet 
um, Governance Forum um, presents a, a good opportunity uh, for a multi-stakeholder discussion around AI and any other you know, global framework that can come out of um, you know, the global scene, and that is something that can be leveraged. Um, looking at the regional level, maybe just uh, taking it um, a level um, you know, sort of like down from, from the global scene, you'd find that from a regional perspective, we have um, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights that came up with a resolution 473 in, in 2021, um, aging states within the African continent to develop, um, you know, strategies and mechanisms and, and legislative uh, provisions that ensure um, that uh, rights are protected when we're looking at the use of AI as well um, in the context of, you know, of, of human rights. And um, to date, since 2021, I would say, like I highlighted it in my earlier remarks, that um, you know we do not actually have you know African states keeping abreast with a, a developing um, policies and, and laws that ensure that um, you know rights are safeguarded. But the real lived realities uh, remain um, within the global south, where we find that there is you know sort of like lack of trust uh, for for use of AI because of uh, inadequate policies. We also see that surveillance, uh, you know, targeting human rights defenders remains a major concern. We do see that um, you know discriminatory practices that come within uh, with the use of AI are still a lived reality on the continent. So I think it's something that needs to be addressed from a you know, global perspective. And I think um, understanding that context, I will um, emphasize again that it's something that is really important. Thank you so much, Tuikile. Uh, and now we have finished it, our first round of uh, comments and, and, and answers from the panelists in this uh, session. So I open the floor for the questions that can come from the audience inside, but also I look to my colleague for knowing if there's any question posted online. Yes, Maria, the chat exploding, but only through my comments. <laughs> People are very shy still, so beautiful crowd out there. Just use this opportunity to actually uh, ask all those questions you don't dare to ask usually on AI and governance. These are just bright people ask, answering your questions. There's one question though, and that is very interesting because it's posed by a target group we very often forget. It's a 70 year old boy, Omar Farouk from Bangladesh. And basically he's asking, how can we ensure that AI regulation and governance at the multilateral level is inclusive and child centered? so that children and young people can benefit from AI while being protected from its potential harms. Thank you. Some, some of the panelists are particularly motivated to take on that question. I think that that question was put in, in the center the issue of like a specific vulnerable community. So when we design for, for, for policy, for governance around artificial intelligence, uh, this is an example that the children can be considered, but there are other also specific communities. So how we design for being inclusive in the governance, for having accommodation also for particular needs for vulnerable groups in, in, a, in a considered way that um, effectively provide governance that works uh, for, for all these different cases. Clara? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think that um, these are certain things which uh, can be addressed both on a voluntary level as well as uh, on, at a regulatory level. We see examples, for instance, uh, Lego uh, implementing quite a lot of measures to make sure that the online presence in an, in an upcoming virtual, uh, require, uh, virtual environments, children's, uh, children are protected. Uh, but of course, uh, here especially, I think that there is important to complement these voluntary efforts with uh, regulatory um, requirements and one example is actually the uh, UK uh, Children's Act because we all agree human rights uh, children needs to need to be protected but it is another question how is that implemented and online and um, the UK code is one example of a regulatory uh, framework um, setting up the 
let's say, the requirements, but when it comes to operationalize it, um, it was an IEEE, one of the IEEE standards, age-appropriate design, which uh, let's give, gives very um, clear guidance to implementers on what it means to implement this, uh, this uh, act. So there are already both regulations as well, and, and this is just one example. This is uh, also discussed in other, uh, in other countries as well. So one example of how, let's say, uh, standards and regulation can interact uh, to protect children online and other human rights, as a matter of fact. Thank you very much. I don't know if other of the panelists have reaction. If not, we move to the next one. You, do you want to react, James? I guess the only thing I'd add, um, you know, is, is just to, to base uh, a lot of the work uh, on, on top of the sort of research that's being done by, by you know, child safety experts around the world. There are just so many great institutions. And you mentioned the Lego example. Uh, but you know, academics and organizations that are looking at the usage patterns and understanding you know, how children and, and, and any number of vulnerable groups interact with these technologies, um, the, the harms or their expectations and how they diverge. Um, prior to working uh, at OpenAI, I worked in uh, virtual and augmented reality. And, and again, you know, in safe settings when, uh, whether it's doctors or, or research teams, uh, really, you know, go deeper and we don't base sort of the work on uh, our understanding as adults. And this, again, whether we're talking about children using these tools or um, elderly population, vulnerable communities who may have less access um, that, it's sort of research-based, that it's evidence-based, uh, and that you know I, I think in, in these settings it's possible for organizations to really work with the community we're trying to build uh, the sort of safety tools and systems around. So um, I don't think there's anything revolutionary about that idea, but 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 these organizations really do such important work, and I think supporting them and advancing their work and putting their research front and center in the development of policy is is essential. Definitely. Thank you very much for that answer. Christian, we have another question, or we have here in the maybe, inside? Maybe we could do it like quid pro quo. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we can take one from here, yeah. Right. Hi, yeah. Um, Viet Vu from Toronto Metropolitan University in Canada. Um, while AI systems are technological in nature, as many of us know, it still involves a lot of human input of various different kinds, and, and we've seen media reports of the kind of labor that is involved in creating AI in the global south to be quite a bit different from the kind of labor that is involved in creating AI tools in the Western world. And so in governing creations of AI, how do we think about sort of international labor um, <coughs> work standards um, regulations? Thank you very much. So anyone from the panelists want to react to that? James. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to begin. I mean, you know, I think, again, the, the importance of protecting labor that's involved in the production of uh, these tools is essential and sort of the work that's been done over the years in, you know, advancing the rights of workers in other sectors, I mean, has to be applied in artificial intelligence and, you know, making sure people are compensated properly, that when there are abuses or harms that they are addressed. Um, and so, you know, again, this is just a, an area where everyone is going to have to continue to be vigilant, whether companies inside the private sector, um, you know, monitoring groups, um, and just making sure that we're listening and understanding the production, um, understanding where uh, voices aren't being heard, uh, or where, um, you know, actors at any level of the, 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 the sort of labor um, uh, and, and employment chain and, and the production, the development of tools um, are, are, are sort of acting improperly. Um, and so, you know, I think if there are places where uh, existing law and policy can't address those harms, and, and you know, we certainly should be, should be vigilant for places where there are gaps, uh, we have to talk about them openly and constructively and, uh, and, and sort of move quickly to make sure there aren't uh, communities and, and types of work that's going on uh, that is abusive or harmful. Thank you very much. Maybe we have time for one last question online, if there is another yes, one. Yes, now they are popping in, actually. Eh? <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything. Uh, it's three questions, but I sum them up, OK? There's uh, one um, colleague from uh, one professor from the Afghanistan Kabul University asking, could we apply generative AI in developing countries like Afghanistan? 
and the education system. I'd say why not, but maybe you have a brighter answer. <laughs> and there are two other questions. One is asking for the accountability aspect. Given that AI is not fully understood and to balance AI values and risks, do you think how should it be dealt with the accountability about AI? <clears throat> and one last question that is rather referring to the ethics. Um, for the moment, AI is providing output based on human-based input data. But with the time, it may be processing its own created data. Uh, so is it ethically acceptable to have machines decide on humans' matters based on no human data? This gets complicated now, huh? What's the plan to make sure once in time will not be left in hand on something out of total control? So, very concrete question on the education system and a very wide. The yeah, for two minutes and a half, it will be a little bit of a challenge, but maybe I can invite Dr. Seth to react in the, uh, the question related to accountability mechanism, how we can build effective accountability mechanisms. Sure, I, I think every single governance question comes down to, ultimately, ac accountability. I think skepticism around governance frameworks that are voluntary come back to the question of accountability. I think even a hard law framework comes down to accountability if the challenge is figuring out what to measure in order to apply a hard law. From our approach, as we think about accountability in the context of a voluntary framework, at least as a bridge to something harder, I think it comes back to what you were talking about in part, which is, there is a reputational cost that comes along with signing up to voluntary commitments. And, and James, I think you'll probably have some views from OpenAI's um, point of view as well on what accountability means for a so-called voluntary commitment. I think insofar as voluntarism and accountability are linked to technical action, you can talk about accountability in meaningful ways because it can eventually be measured. And I think that measurement question is extremely important to dive down below the, the abstract level of principles where I think there is an increasing amount of skepticism that principles can achieve accountability. Thank you. We have one last question, but now I'm gonna close the queue because we need to move to the next seg segment, so please. Uh, hello everyone. This is my name is Ananda. For the record, I'm the chair of USIGF Nepal, and I represent a developing economy. And while IGF 2020 is being bombarded with all the topics from AI, we are still struggling to uh, connect the people. Forty percent of the population in Nepal and APEC region is still unconnected. And if we see the forty percent, those are connected are the newly adopters of the internet. My question is, while developed nations are adopting AI and these technologies, uh, the nations like Nepal are thriving to actually counter the disinformation, misinformation that are being held by the generative AI that became so popular in 2022 with the use of, uh, you can name it, ChatGPT or Google Bard. So in this scenario, how does developing economy help this kind of nations in uh, co-entering the digital era. And another thing is we discuss this kind of issues in multi-stakeholder platforms, but these uh, platforms are not uh, capable enough to actually shape the policies because the, when it comes to policies, multilateral system actually influence the policies across the world. So how does developed economy co-create the digital ecosystem that is inclusive for all. Thank you. I think it's a very complex qu question to answer in just a few minutes. I probably will need to answer it from different panelists here, but I don't know, for example, James, if you have a take in terms of like the jurisdictional channel, sorry, juris jurisdictional challenges that has the idea of like implementing this governance mechanism for companies that offer services to different contexts. Yeah. 
I'll maybe start with two uh, projects uh, that I think begin to get it uh, sort of solving for this, um, but again, are just the beginning. Uh, we recently launched a project, uh, a, a grant program uh, for democratic inputs to AI to sort of give, um, you know, communities, nations, uh, uh, different domains, the, the possibility of, of, of trying to surface, you know, what are the unique values and the types of outputs that are responsive to uh, sort of local contexts from AI systems. Um, uh, that, that that a community sort of expects and those you know acknowledging that those may diverge um, and and sort of beginning to to figure out what is that 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 process that is sort of very locally regionally community driven uh, and how can we sort of build on that so I think that's going to be one um, important stepping stone uh, another uh, is uh, we actually also just announced uh, what's called our red teaming network uh, and just the security and safety testing that is very specific, you know, to Nepal, to uh, nations and communities around the world, and sort of, you know, again, encouraging safety and security testing, submitting evaluations. Uh, you know, you mis mentioned mis and disinformation. Um, if there are types of whether it's linguistic failures or ways that uh, you know large language models or tools like ours are attacked or or vulnerable to to sort of certain types of outputs, we want to know. You know, we want to we want to really hear where we're falling short or um, where, you know, perhaps a, a gap in understanding or a particular um, type of action is producing uh, results that are especially harmful. And so I think that practice, building that community of practice, submitting those types of evaluations and growing the community that is doing that uh, in different countries, in different regions, uh, across sectors is going to be important. Thank you very much, Jane. And with that intervention, we will move to the next segment of this conversation that is particularly um, linked and related to the role of uh, IGF. So we are all here uh, sitting in this room and, and participating of this event uh, on internet governance. And there is a particular value on the conversation that happened in this space and have been happening for 18 years, shaping digital technology, shaping the, the, the form and the use of the internet. So on that note, uh, what, what we want to question uh, during this part of the conversation uh, with the intervention of the speakers, is the role of the IGF as a convener and facilitator of artificial governance action. And for, for that conversation, I will turn first to <laughs> Clara. Um, and I will interrogate um, about the experience of IEEE working and developing voluntary guidance. What is just per your perspective about the opportunities and limitation of self-regulatory effort to ensure responsible AI governance? And what could be the contribution of the IEEE experience in the role of, of IGF facilitating this international governance uh, of AI discussions? Thank you. Thank you. So um, we see our standards being adopted. Um, actually, you know, once a standard is out, you, we as a standard setting organization, we don't really need to know who adopted it. Um, we just had a meetup last week and I was uh, surprised to see, you know, how many people um, actually say that they know the standards, they implement it in different projects, uh, both private as well as from public actors. Um, so I think that this, I would like to bring here, uh, well, one example is, um, speaking of children, uh, a UNICEF project uh, which uh, really used the value-based design approach uh, to change, let's say, the initial design of a system to, um, to, uh, to find talent in Africa. Uh, from, let's say, a closed system which was intransparent to something which um, the young people actually have agency now on. So that is actually a proof of concept that you, by uh, having certain methodologies and taking these uh, values and expectations of the community into account, you actually uh, end up with a different system. And I want to discuss here really the incentives of the voluntary um, engagements and what are the incentives of adopting a standard. Well, one is, um, and we have also the city of Vienna who is uh, one of the, our pilot projects for the certification. Of course, if you are discussing with public authorities, one of their incentives is, is trust. Yeah, they want uh, the citizen to trust their uh, services. Um, 
and uh, you probably ha also have a lot of private actors who have the same incentive. But uh, if we're talking about um, sea level um, uh, people, of course, there's also the, the discussion, so what is it in for me? And we know from uh, business schools that uh, one way of, um, uh, well, making money, well, two ways, the one is to minimize uh, cost and the other is to differentiate or focus. And uh, we saw actually in the, in the meetup investors who were interested in this standard because one way of doing value-based design or one outcome is that you end up with better value proposition. And I think that this is an important way of moving away only from the risk-based approach to actually thinking what kind of measures of success do we want to have in the future? Do we want to still have uh, performance, which is of course important for us for the technical community, or profit, which is of course important for the pr private sector, how do we incorporate these other two dimensions, the people and the planet uh, dimension? And um, I think that uh, this is something that we have to discuss collectively. And of course, the other incentive is, um, of course, to uh, satisfy regulatory, uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, we see that now with the AI Act, a lot of uh, people are interested in these standards because they anticipate that these will be, uh, will be required. But here is also something where I want to say, to very much stress that there is a limit on voluntary um, measures. So we as a technical organization, or I think also as a private actors, our, the business of private actors is not to maintain human rights and dom democracy and rule of law. Of course, they should, uh, we all should be uh, part of it and we should comply with it. But I think that it is, there are certain red lines which have to be um, decided in a democratic process. And the only way to do, uh, let's say, a common approach to it is, is with this kind of feedback mechanism. If we want to have something like a uh, global governance, we need to establish these lines of communications to have standardized way of uh, reporting incidents, to have benchmarking, testing facilities, and have being here in Kyoto, having something like the uh, international panel of climate change, which actually has an advisory role to governments to say, where is it where we actually need to do something and, um, and, and uh, see if new regulation is needed or if regulation needs to be adapted. As a matter of fact, we are just doing this with the Council of Europe with one of the, um, one of the applications of artificial intelligence immer uh, immersive realities. We are working with them to see what are the possible impacts of human rights uh, of these new uh, technologies. Thank you very much. I think that you bring super relevant point about the role of incentive. I would be very happy to hear the take of the other speaker when they intervene about that because I think it's, it's a challenge for everyone like to like identify and align with those incentives in order to bring the process to the right direction. But for now I will turn to Arisa um, and, and ask you and your experience as a social science uh, researcher uh, and, and your activities in that role include facilitating the dialogue with various stakeholders. What are some of the challenges in conducting that uh, facilitation of the multi-stakeholder engagement with AI governance uh, that you can share with us and, and how this can be effectively, for example, this learning integrated in the role that IGF need to play a facilitator of these discussions? Thank you very much. Um, so I, I think the, the role of the IGF is really uh, important. And uh, I, I wanted to tell just one um, episode. Well, actually, the, the previous session, I organized the session. And uh, I invited uh, the, uh, my, my friends uh, who are actually uh, in a wheelchair. However, uh, he, he or she can't come. Because, so I actually brought the robot that avatar robots that they can operate uh, from remotely from their home. Uh, so that kind of uh, thing is really important. And uh, to be more inclusive, I think we need to involve as many people as we can. And, uh, and, and this kind of things uh, kind of connects to the first 17-year-old boy's question. But 
Um, so it is really important to uh, be connected to all those uh, other stakeholders or the other people uh, uh, with some challenges. And also, uh, those technology actually empowers people, so, so, no, so you know that they, they can come uh, virtually come to these places and uh, make the presentations, to interact with others. But uh, on the other side, uh, in, in our session, what we discussed is that uh, uh, although we have that kind of system, it's uh, on the other side, it's uh, uh, vulnerable uh, because if you know uh, the the crisis happens or you know the power went down, you know those kind of technology are not uh, actually uh, available. So uh, I think it's really important to when we're discussing about the AI governance, we need to put the humans uh, also into this kind of systems. And uh, uh, human is the kind of the most flexible, you know, uh, or may maybe resilient. Uh, to to uh, to be kind of uh, adaptive to uh, all those uh, the kind of the crisis situation or maybe uh, uh, how to say um, uh, to 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 be more uh, creative and to be more active. So uh, what I wanted to uh, expect uh, when I uh, what I expect to this IGF forum is that uh, uh, we can talk about the AI governance, but we need to include human and the human centered uh, is the very key word and. Uh, uh, I, and I guess uh, th this kind of topic, uh, I think, uh, is really important to uh, repeatedly come out to all this kind of discussion and uh, like the democracy, uh, the, the rule of law or the human rights. So uh, with this kind of topic uh, shared with people and then it will be kind of uh, connected or the collaborate, brought to the collaboration. And uh, the, the last thing I would like to uh, expect to the IGF is that uh, all the not uh, uh, all, all the in interesting and important things have been discussed in this panel session. However, maybe the next step action is discussed outside this room. So uh, with this, you know, the, the over the lunch or maybe having in-person discussion or maybe just having the tea. So that kind of forum is really important. And because IGF forum is open to everybody, we can talk with the person, you know, just next to you. And uh, so it's, it's really uh, important. So. Um, I, I, what I what I wanted to uh, speak out at the, uh, or expect to the IGF is that uh, to be uh, inclusive and also uh, th this kind of you know in person and informal communication as is really uh, important uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate that uh, many people came to Kyoto and also enjoy the Kyoto. <laughs> Definitely, we are enjoying Kyoto. Thank you very much for hosting us, and I think that. This conversation about inclusiveness it has so many dimensions. It had the, the dimension of the different stakeholders. It had the dimension of the particular situation of uh, vulnerable groups or, or groups in vulnerable condition, which is more appropriate. Uh, but also has a geopolitical and geographic dimension. And on that, I will invite uh, Tuikili to react in, in that sense in what is generally missing in terms of effective inclusion of diversity of factor in the conversation of AI governance and how IGF can continue contributing for addressing that challenge. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'll start from a premise of just highlighting that um, the, I know there are a number of colleagues who were not able to be here um, because of visa issues. And I think uh, when we're talking about inclusion, I think it's something that we need to proactively think about in terms of how we can make sure that um, we have inclusive processes but also accessible platforms for those from the Global South um, specifically. Um, and um, just going uh, beyond that, I'll highlight that I think within um, you know the Internet Governance Forum, there's need for um, you know continued in engagements and um, engagements with, with with critical stakeholders um, and a victim-centered approach to um, the kind of conversations that that happen here in the sense of having everybody vulnerable groups uh, well represented in terms of the conversations that happen, especially when we're looking at AI. Um, I will also highlight that that um, um, I think 
an understanding of the global asymmetries. I, I think it's something that is uh, important to um, continue to highlight um, because we do realize that when we're looking at um, you know global north versus global south, um, the different contexts. And I think it's something that um, I highlighted earlier, the importance of, of context. And I think my colleague here as well highlighted the aspect of understanding the different contexts that. Um, um, that are represented within the Internet uh, Governance Forum. And I think it's something that will continue to shape processes um, even better and also to be able to ensure that we come up with, um, you know, um, AI-focused, um, um, you know, solutions or resolutions that ensure that, um, you know, no one is left behind when we're looking at, at fundamental rights and freedoms particularly. And I think just to um, emphasize that I think definitely this is, um, you know, a, pro a, a you know, a forum that um, we continue to leverage with regards to um, advancing, um, you know, the promotion, protection uh, as well of, of fundamental rights and freedoms, but also we need to continue to engage in terms of uh, remediation for uh, victims who are likely to suffer the adverse impacts, um, you know, of, of, of design of technology. And that is something that cannot be overstated. And um, I will, I think, just you know, round off by just highlighting that um, I think it's it's critical that um, we, we we continue to to highlight that there's a need to break down the walls. I, earlier, I highlighted about the center of power, the centers of power when we're looking at AI, and I think um, the IGF is that you know, good opportunity to be able to, to break down the walls that um, uh, stand in between uh, the centers of power in a multi, a real multi-stakeholder uh, engagement um, where, um, you know, all voices are heard and, and no one is left behind. Thank you very much. And in this same line, I am Dr. Santer. I invite you to react to this very same issue of like how to deal with this diversity of realities and the diversity of processes that are ongoing for dealing with this diversity of realities at the national level, at the regional level in some cases, like as the European Union that Clara had bring before, um, but also at the global uh, governance systems, some propositions coming from the UN, in creating new bodies for overseeing uh, the governance of artificial intelligence, how that also uh, can be approached from the perspective of uh, a government that is conducting its own efforts at the domestic level for, for finding the, the most appropriate way to address the, the governance of artificial intelligence and being inclusive in this, and how those efforts and this experience that is uh, acquiring the government in, in the process of doing that can also be uh, shared and, and contributed in, in this uh, forum of the IGF for, for continue um, making these uh, global artificial intelligence governance uh, discussions uh, connected and interoperable. <laughs> Thank you. Is the answer yes to that? <laughs> uh, but how? The, 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 how? the, the, the okay. tricky question the how. is the how. Let, let, me, let me go rewind just a minute to the question of accessible platforms and walk into how I think the IGF can play a role. I think if you get to the end of the governance story and you get it all right, you're still left with the question of why we care about AI. And I think the answer that I think we believe in the United States and I think most people in this audience believe is that you should employ the most powerful technologies to address the most important problems in the world. And how do you get powerful AI developers, whether they're companies or governments, although it's usually companies, to devote time and attention to govern AI responsibly and then to direct it towards addressing society's greatest challenges? And the answer is, the multi-stakeholder community, directing them through conversation, delicate pressure, into thinking about those problems in meaningful ways. A few weeks ago at the UN General Assembly's High Level Week, there were a series of events that brought together different parts of the multi-stakeholder community and the multilateral community and countries to talk about these issues. Um, Secretary of State of the United States 
co-convened one with the whole series of diverse countries and companies, including OpenAI, and we just simply asked these companies what they were doing to address society's greatest challenges, uh, defined however they wanted to within the context of the SDGs. And if you open up those conversations, and you have them at the UN, you have them in the General Assembly, and you have them at the IGF. If you ask questions about the impact on labor, if you ask questions about what we're doing to protect children's safety in the AI era, if we ask about inclusive access, it naturally changes the entire conversation. And so the young gentleman who asked a question about whether or not the multi-stakeholder community could make policy or not, or not, I think there was a sense of skepticism. I actually am far more optimistic. Policy is made, at least in democracies, including ours in the United States, by listening to the inputs of everyone. Our entire architecture in the United States for our AI governance framework was built on listening to the multi-stakeholder community in a domestic context. The entire architecture for thinking about the voluntary commitments, our most recent one, included extensive multi-stakeholder conversations. And these are the way in which governments in democracies actually formulate policy. No government has the hubris to believe, at least the ones that I've talked to, that they understand foundation models in generative AI. They need the technical community, the standard setting bodies to help them. They need companies and the experts and companies to help them. They need civil society, human rights organizations to help them. And out of that input comes an output and that output is policy. And then you need governments to actually enforce the policies. And that I think is actually where we ha probably have a bigger challenge. But if you take the step back and you say to yourself, how do we ensure accessibility? How do we ensure collaboration? We should encourage the energy in all of the forums, whether it's the UK Safety Summit, whether it's the G7 Hiroshima process, whether it's the UN's H-Lab, because we are at the early stages of the next era of AI, and we need all of those conversations at this point in time. Thank you very much. And I turn kind of a similar question now <laughs> to the private sector uh, represented here by James, in terms of like, you, you don't have uh, jurisdictional borders in the offering of your services. I mean, you, need, you are binded by different <laughs> regulatory frameworks in different jurisdiction, but you need to deal with this question about uh, artificial intelligence governance in a way in which you can operate as a company and offer your products and services beyond the borders. So what are the challenges uh, in that perspective in terms of like how you are dealing with the discussions of uh, artificial intelligence governance in, at this different local and domestic level, regional in some cases, global also, uh, and, and how bringing some of those challenges to the discussion here in the IGF will be useful in terms of address them for the perspective of the industry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, start with the first challenge that comes to mind, uh, which is sort of size. You know, we are trying to make sure we are in as many of the conversations uh, that, uh, you know, as, as we can be in. And, and you know, in, in all uh, regions of the world, in every country, you know, cities, states, uh, geographies, they're important discussions. It's impossible to be in every room. Um, but I think coming off sort of the recent listening tour that we did around the world, um, we have a great respect for sort of the, just the, the variance and sort of the needs for these tools, the, the, the different restraints that are, are going to be placed on them on areas where, you know, hard and soft law will differ. Um, and so just making sure that we are, you know, in the right places, that we're listening fully, um, you know, that we're providing the right sorts of research and technical assistance. I think that's probably one of the, the sort of threshold uh, challenges, you know, of just, just sort of making sure we're participating in the right ways, hearing and, and learning in, in, in the right venues. Um, then from there, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think sometimes there's a discussion uh, about the sort of spectrum of 
all right, you know, you have these really important short, medium-term risks, um, as well as sort of some of the longer-term, you know, ensuring safety for humanity, um, sort of on the road to artificial general intelligence, uh, you know, which is sort of seen as a spectrum and sometimes talked about as if, you know, you have to make a binary choice of either sort of addressing short to medium-term harms versus, you know, looking sort of further out into the future uh, and, and being focused on building the international and domestic systems to solve for those. Um, and, you know, we don't think that's a, a choice that you, like, we have to work on both, right? And we as the private sector, as a, as a you know, as a, a research lab, have to be contributing to those discussions as countries formulate their laws, but also on the other side uh, of the regulatory uh, conversation as, uh, you know, s countries, societies decide how they want to use these tools uh, for good. Um, and so, you know, being in enough rooms, contributing the sort of core research and technical understanding, um, making sure that, you know, the, the, the transparency, the, the work that we're doing around our tools is um, aiding those conversations uh, in as many geographies and for as many communities as possible. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's a responsibility. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, we just welcome and uh, you know, uh, sort of being in, in as many of those rooms and as many of those conversations as we can be. Thank you very much. And now I open the floor again for reactions and comments from the audience here inside, but also online. Do we have any online? Yes, yeah, sure. There's Please a go lot ahead. going on, Maria. <laughs> Let me start with one question from um, uh, Mokha Beri from Iran. Could shaping the UN Convention on Artificial Intelligence help to manage its risks? Do geopolitical conflicts and strategic competition between AI powers allow this at all? And what is or could be the role of the IGF in this regard? And if I may, I would like to seize the opportunity to, to enlarge the question a little bit also to you, James, because I have the great opportunity sitting next to you, and you being a newbie here at the IGF, not just you as an individual, but representing open AI. What do you think could be the added value of the IGF when it comes to the discussions right now on regulations of AI and governance? And, and uh, do you have the impression open AI could kind of contribute in future times as well? So two questions in one. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think to one of the comments earlier just on both benchmarking, like defining what does good look like, I think that's going to be important just as much from a technical perspective as it is in sort of policy development around the world. And so I think there's a really important role for IGF and international institutions uh, to, to really harmonize those discussions and say, you know, these are the benchmarks. These are how we're going to be grading our progress. Um, and that's probably where, where I'd start. Um, you know, similarly, to, to address sort of the first part of the question of sort of where we can build on existing work that's gone, I mean, you know, I think for a lot of these technologies and, and sort of where we're heading next, uh, it's important to build on just the, the important conventions and treaties, areas of law uh, that we already have in place. You know, we, we, we um, and, and that's not to say that there won't be, you know, new approaches, new gaps as we've been talking about today. Uh, but we also don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel everywhere and so take the hard work that's been done in areas like human rights um, and, and draw on that as we sort of figure out the places where we want to set new standards going forward. Thank you, James. I don't know, there is any inside question? No, I don't see anyone. Ah, there, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> okay, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Jose Mirzapur from Data for Governance Lab for the record. Um, thank you for bringing up this uh, crucial issue of uh, how IGF, whether or how IGF can help uh, to deal with AI, AI specifically, the governance and the regulatory issues. I think as this is not the first IGF we may learn from the past. Uh, you know whether, uh, you know better than me, uh, we have discussed many times for more than one decade about the governance and regulation of big data, uh, pri digital privacy, uh, I don't know, like data governance. And 
even finally we didn't, uh, we were not able to reach a global consensus, a global framework to deal with them. Even in both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, we were, we were not able to reach the same uh, regulatory framework and laws. Uh, and you, you can compare now the DSA and DMA in Europe with the way U.S. is dealing with their, uh, with their companies. So my big question to uh, a bit add a spice to your uh, interesting topic is, as far as we have not been able to uh, reach a global consensus and global framework to deal with big data, how can we be optimistic to reach a global framework to deal with AI? And you know, well, AI is rooted in big data as well. This, and uh, just last, last but, but not least, I have very quick yes-no question for James, uh, Mr. James, who is representing the private sector today. Right now, is there any emergency shutdown procedure in your company? Like, if you buy the case, you find that there is a, like, very uh, uh, emergency danger uh, coming out from your products and your AI models. Is there any procedure in, in place right now for an emergency shutdown or not? Thank you. I can take that, that last one. And so, you know, when there are, uh, we have harm reporting and we take you know, security reports, and so we, you know, can turn our tools off by, you know, geography, um, you know, in that way. I, I think there are probably many layers to that question beyond just, you know, you know on-off access, um, but happy to sort of follow up and, and understand sort of the, the types of uh, shutoffs that you have, have in mind. You want to react to that? <laughs> so maybe, maybe because I've never come to the IGF before, I'm I'm not as down <laughs> down as you. <laughs> I think there's a tremendous amount of consensus on AI governance. I think obviously the challenge of enforcement and what the regimes look like may be a bridge too far at a global level, but I don't I don't think that's you know an existential threat to the value of these conversations or pursuing an AI governance conversation. So for instance, if we were to ask ourselves, moving into a future in which foundation models and generative AI will likely subsume narrow AI, what, what are the kinds of safeguards you would want in place as a governance structure? I think everybody would basically agree. You want some kind of en internal and external red teaming. I think you generally agree that you want information sharing among those who are developing these models. I think you generally agree that for finished models, which are potentially profoundly powerful, you would want some sort of cybersecurity to protect model weights. I think you generally agree that you can't solely trust those developing them to be accountable, and so you'd want third-party discovery and auditability in some way, shape, or form. I think you'd basically want developers to agree on public reporting on capabilities. I think you'd basically agree that they should prioritize research and safety risk, including on issues like bias and discrimination. And in my sense is, if you get to the end of this, you'd also basically agree that they should employ these to address society's greatest challenges. And so at that level, I'm sort of fairly optimistic that we're at least going in the right direction. Thank you. I see two more speakers line up here. I don't know if we have some online two. Can you read the two and so we can have time for the other speakers? Okay, I have... Uh, and we post all of them to, to the panelists so you react. I'll be very quick. Two, two questions. Actually, one from my side to Seth because it's really pressing and I'm hacking the system right now. But Seth, you said before we have to get all stakeholders involved. So I'd be interested in your opinion on the fact that was uttered somewhere here, I think by the steering group UN, on a kind of the analogy of a, uh, the, we need something like the International Atomic Energy Agency for AI, this idea, which sounds kind of rude. Do you think that is a, an adequate idea or not? And maybe I can pose the other online question already? So yeah. Get rid of me. Uh, that is a colleague, uh, actually a member of the parliament from South Africa, who's asking Willem Faber, um, considering that AI technology was, to de was developed by humans, could we not explore the possibility of leveraging AI 
to establish government regulatory systems instead of relying solely on human efforts to find solutions. More of a technical thing. So AI regulating AI, basically that's the proposition. <laughs> So maybe we can turn for, for that one to, to James on what are the, <laughs> the take and with said for the other one, yeah. Well, I, one area of, I think, long-term research, this actually goes back to a question that was raised earlier. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to have humans in the loop in, in the development of, of systems and in their testing. You know, we've talked a lot about red teaming and audibility. And yet there are a lot of research possibilities around uh, the use of, say, synthetic data in the future. You know, we've been talking about bias um, and, and sort of what the, the future avenues for addressing them might be. And there's one area of sort of work uh, around the world that I think needs a lot more exploration in sort of how we might create high quality data sets um, that uh, are you know, derivative of, uh, you know, sort of research work by domains um, to sort of generate um, the ability to, uh, you know, perform all sorts of new tasks. And in that way, you would have, you know, information not based on sort of a current corpus of the internet or people's information um, that, of course, involves a lot of human training to get to, um, but that is derivative and is used to sort of build new capabilities. I think that's going to show up in some form, uh, you know, in a lot of domains. And, and there are pieces of that that are going to require a lot of, um, you know, monitoring and evaluation. But there are other ways in which sort of synthetic uh, data sets um, help solve some of the problems that we've been talking about. Not, it's not a panacea, of course. Um, and, and that what you could use in sort of deconstructing and reconstructing information that tries to resolve gaps in, say, language uh, of the available information we have today or over or under representation of certain regions or genders or otherwise, that, that that synthetic data could then be used and applied to, you know, create personal tutors or to improve uh, genomics research or advance our understanding of climate. So um, the synthetic, again, that's one area of research. There's a lot to do there. But I do think as we talk about sort of machine created data, again, with a lot of humans and a lot of important standards bodies and research institutions and government security testers in the loop, um, there are actually some really, I think, interesting possibilities there. But that doesn't mean we can just sort of step away and, and let that happen. So I'll just leave that there. Do you want to react to that, Clara, maybe? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, we have a working group on uh, defining the quality of synthetic data because, again, we are coming back to define what is good, what is then ethical synthetic data. And, um, yes, I agree with you that actually it is one of the way of uh, providing, um, let's say, private data to be used for research. And uh, so if you're using it in that way, I think it's okay. But coming back to the why, um, why it is important to think about the global regulation or global, global governance, sorry, uh, of AI, uh, coming back to the analogy of electricity, I think that now uh, we we have this moment where it is out in the open and it's being used in so different way, uh, different uh, ways and different uh, geographies. So we need, now we are coming to, uh, to Japan, we use a different plug and socket. So we need to have at least a transparency what is being used there? Where, where is it where you know, we need to adapt? We need a, to have a kind of, um, I mentioned before, transparency in the sense of um, uh, what you know, basic information about how these uh, AI models have been, uh, has, have been used and what is important for that context. And I think that it is laudable that, of course, we have this private... Um, um, uh, private efforts to make uh, AI as, uh, as trustworthy as, as possible, but it is still something which is closed. So, uh, I mean, some of the things are uh, made, uh, made open, but it is, again, voluntary. So we need to have, a, like, a certain common ground to understand, you know, wh what, you know what we are talking about, what are the incidents, <laughs> what are the data sets, what are, where is synthetic data being used, what kind of quality of synthetic data is being used. And, and I think that once it becomes so everywhere, uh, I think that there is a pressure as well to kind of have this... Um, you know, standardized way of understanding the impact of AI. Thank you very much. So I turn 
to Dr. Santer for the other question quickly. And after that, I will take one more question from the audience. And I will ask you, all the speakers, to do a round of final remarks so we can start to close. Thank you. Go ahead. So I certainly think the IAEA is an imperfect analogy for the current technology and the situation we faced for, for multiple reasons. One being the predominance of private sector developers of AI versus state-based questions about nuclear control. Uh, the second being questions of the ease and facilitation of verification and what you're trying to verify and track, I think is quite different, at least in the era in which the IAEA was developed versus what we're talking about in the AI era. I think there is one instructive uh, lesson that comes out of the IAEA, however, and that is uh, between 1945 and 1957 when the IAEA was established was 12 years. And so as we pound the table and demand action to institutionalize global uh, governance around AI, we should be a little more patient with how this evolves, uh, and I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I would, actually, I won't. I, I will say, look, we do need scientific networks that span countries that are convened to take on these problems, if for no other reason to build shared assessments of risk, to agree on shared uh, standards for evaluation and capabilities, which I think we will need. Um, shared international approaches to. And so I think we should continue to look for the right kinds of models for international cooperation, even if that's not the right one. Thank you very much. Please, your question. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Christine Mojimba from Uganda, but I'll be speaking as a mother in this regard and uh, really advocating for the seven-year-old boy. I think it was from Bangladesh who asked uh, a question on children. And, and there have been follow-up discussions on whether such forums have a place in um, influencing policy. And being from a technical background and many other backgrounds, sometimes I find that we get lost in the, in the high-tech definitions and all that, and we lose the low-hanging fruit of common denominators such as what we shall all agree even in our diversity that we have all been children before. And um, even in the session before when we were talking about cybercrime, it came out clearly that we need to protect the future generation. So I think for me, my ask to experts and panels like you, um, as you have your elevation pitches wherever you are, is um, not to, to sort of have the low-hanging fruits come out. If you all agree that you have been children and we can find the child in us, let's at least get there in addressing the AI that you want. And maybe these other things we will learn from there to have the inclusive designs you are talking about, the how, whether to buy us things or not. So for me, it was really that plea of let's find <laughs> spaces, even in harmonization, in addressing common, common denominators such as preserving future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a question, but a comment also. So I invite you to react in a final round, considering this last question, but your remarks in one and a half minute or less. <laughs> I invite Jane to start, and I will move this direction. Yeah. So just fi fi final remarks here, or? <laughs> If you want to address some of the last question, and if not, your final remarks, yes. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, again, I think the, the sort of public and private collaboration on sort of the safety of these tools, ensuring that um, uh, both on the design side, on sort of the reporting, um, and in sort of the research we do about how children, other communities are uh, using these tools, how to protect them, how to make sure, uh, you know, even where, you know, tools like ours are, are not for use for, uh, you know, anyone under 13, you know, understanding how young people and communities that are vulnerable come to these tools, how they interact with them, is just going to be an important part of the work ahead and being responsive to the new research that comes out of, uh, of sort of the, the academic uh, community and civil society um, and, 
you know, being able to action reports of crime or of misuse uh, is, is going to be key. I think the, in terms of sort of closing remarks, I mean, I think is we're, we're at this important moment and it's just going to be essential that we really build on the momentum uh, that, you know, has uh, been put together, the, whether the work on the, sort of the voluntary commitments that we very much see as our responsibility to continue to act on um, and to contribute to the international regulatory conversation and the promotion uh, of long-term safety, um, that we just, again, sort of continue to get more and more concrete uh, about, you know, where we're heading, uh, about the, the sort of international tools that we want to apply to these uh, to these new technologies, um, and that we build the capacity both for identifying harms, reporting those harms, understanding uh, what new capabilities uh, are, are, are sort of working or are um, putting communities and, and, and people at risk, but also what the really, uh, you know, the, the unique opportunities are here for these types of tools. And those will be different. They will be adopted at different rates. We've, the analogies to, uh, you know, electricity, uh, I think, is, is instructive because, uh, you know, there will be different decisions made in education sectors or health sectors and finance and other areas. Um, but you know, really getting concrete about how we can take some of these tools and apply them to problems for people while also, you know, trying to solve for the long-term uh, harms and risks, uh, I think is going to be important. So I'm really glad to uh, be here and uh, participate in, in this discussion. Thank you very much. Happy to have you. Yes, also. thank you. Clara. Thank you. Um, well, I think that uh, especially when it comes now to generative AI, um, what will be important is to be as agile as possible and this will be important to be from the organizational level to the national level to the global level and I think that uh, for all these levels we need feedback mechanisms that work and um, also um, at the organization level we may have to make sure that these feedbacks are also taken into account uh, for uh, the further development of, of this foundational model. Uh, I agree with you that, of course, it has to uh, take risk into account and it uh, has to be differentiated. But I think that for certain high-risk applications, we have to have conformity assessments. And this has to be done through independent uh, organizations because there is, again, a different incentive um, to self-certification uh, than, uh, than, than uh, being compliant. Um, I think as well that um, maybe the International Atomic Agency is really um, difficult as an analogy because we have so many uses of artificial intelligence. Um, I would like to bring back again the idea of more of an independent panel, independent multi-stakeholder panel, which as a matter of fact should be also uh, be implemented also for this important um, uh, technologies which are acting basically as an infrastructure right now. So uh, if it's a public infrastructure, we also need to have a, a multi-stakeholder, let's say, governance for that. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe more similar to CERN, <laughs> that at atomic energy, just another idea. So I will move to Toby Keely for your final remarks. Thank you so much. I think what is clear from this conversation is that as human beings, we cannot cede or forfeit our rights to technology, and we need to continue to, I think, emphasize the importance of us remaining with that agency over our fundamental rights and freedoms, and in that way, we'll ensure that children's rights are promoted in the use of AI, women's rights are promoted in the use of AI. We'll look, I think, we could also center conversations around environmental rights, etc. and I think it's a critical conversation that we need to continue to uh, engage engage in and looking at um, you know basic concepts such as participatory democracy I think bringing it into the realm of internet governance I think it's something that we need to also emphasize that there's need for participation of everyone marginalized groups vulnerable groups but also ensuring that the processes that we have um, are actually very inclusive and we have a truthful and meaningful um, multi-stakeholder approach thank you very much Arisa 
So um, thank you. So um, I I think that uh, the, the air governance discussion is really important and also very uh, challenging because the the AI itself uh, actually kind of you know, changes and evolves, and also the situation changes, the environment changes, and uh, uh, in that sense, the the people who who we need to involve will kind of expand and never you know shrinks. So the the, the more people should be involved in this kind of discussion and. In that sense, uh, in my first remarks, I kind of mentioned that we need some kind of concrete cases and to discuss about what, what will be the risk, what do you mean by transparency, and what do you mean by how, how to take the accountability at all. However, uh, as many people as we are going to include it, we, we need some kind of philosophy or you know shared concept that we can be united and we can at least uh, collaborate in with the same uh, same context that we, we or the same same kind of uh the, the, the common understanding or the common concept that we share. So in, in that sense, I, I think uh, the, these couple of days discussion uh, really have uh, uh, kind of come, come up with the various uh, important concepts and the principles, goals, and, and so I, I really uh, like look, uh, in, 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 uh, kind of uh, uh, enjoyed uh, this discussion. And uh, so the, the last thing I would like to mention is this is not the end, but this is just like a starting point and uh, well, this, this kind of the this wouldn't never end but uh, I, I think we can enjoy the process of this kind of exchanges and discussion and uh, we, we need to be uh, uh, we need to be kind of uh, aware of that uh, to, to involve as many people as we can thank you and the final word from the speaker <laughs> You did a great job moderating us and keeping us on time, thank you. Uh, I, I will sum up my take and theme uh, using a quote from a famous basketball coach about AI governance. Uh, Be quick, but don't hurry. <laughs> thank you very much for that. So we're running out of time, I suppose to summarize a little bit of this rich discussion, but I only will provide the highlight of the takeaways rather than the full takeaway. I think that we have heard, uh, the, the main takeaway that we have heard here from different perspective of the value of this multi-stakeholder conversation and the value of like making, uh, continuing making it as much inclusive as possible uh, and enjoying of the participation of the people that is already in this room but also looking for the people that is still outside of the room uh, and thinking about this as a necessary step in, in what uh, Dr. Center was inviting us to, to be quick but not hurry. So take the time for listening, different perspective, and take the time to evaluate the different options to address the different challenges. So we, we talk in, uh, purposely about uh, artificial intelligent governance because we think that it's a broader concept than just regulation or just voluntary guidance or just ethics. It's a broader aspect and this is the value of the Internet Governance Forum that we can reach uh, different uh, aspects of the discussion and bring different levels of expertise and also be mindful of all this level of inclusivity and diversity, the one that, cons that referred to vulnerable groups, the one that referred to different uh, fields of expertise and the one that also also refer to different uh, geopolitical realities. So as Arisa was mentioning, this is not the end, it's the starting. Thank you very much for keeping connected with the process. And thank you all my speakers. <laughs>